Toby's turning this way. Be careful, guys. What are you doing? Mike, the reason I wanted to show that clip is because of the the horror in the voices of the people who are experiencing that tragedy as it's unfolding. I mean, the shooter is still on the roof taking shots. This is before the the still shots of of his body lying up there, and and I want to share it, not to sensationalize, but to convey to people that this is what's in store. This is where we're headed if we don't find a way to resolve our differences at the ballot box. And before I get your reaction, I'll be the first to say that that I often take it for granted that when I say something um, at, at an event or even on my show, like, you know, we have to, we have to, do what we have to to stop Trump from from winning, from becoming the dictator he says he wants to be. I just take it for granted that that, that means nonviolently. But we're in new territory here. And I have to change my thinking. I have to change my my affect, my vocabulary, so that every time I tell the truth about the threats we face, I caveat it by saying, but we have to stick to nonviolence. This is not an, an ends justify the means argument at all. Uh, if, if Trump wins a free and fair election, he's the president. We don't get to stop him this way. And it goes both ways. Yeah, I think that's really well said, Ken. I mean, and, and I am glad that you, for all of the horror of it, decided to start by showing that clip, because I think that's maybe the most important thing of all the things that people like you and I might say that we might be able to convey to our neighbors. Um, I mean, as you know, I mean, I, I served in, in Iraq and Afghanistan on the ground. Um, I have seen what bullets do to people and I have seen what violence does to communities. And I've seen what happens when politics turns into a cycle of personal vengeance. Both countries descended into that. Most of the most dangerous people that we faced in Iraq and Afghanistan, were people motivated not by political ideas, but by loss, by deeply personal loss. The most dangerous person in the Pesh River Valley for months when I was there, in a hotbed of violence in Afghanistan, was a very talented marksman whose brother had been killed in a different part of the country by parties unknown. His war was a personal war of vengeance. The thing about that is that all wars become that over time. Once violence begins, it creates a cycle where it's it's beyond politics. It becomes something deeply personal. We still have time as a country to avoid that. Once you're in that cycle, getting out of it is a generational project if you're lucky. Look at Colombia, Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, all kinds of places where you and I have spent time. That understanding, we have to share it with our neighbors. It's not an easy message to hear. And so if the only way to hear it is to see what happens to people when somebody starts shooting, maybe that's what it takes. Um, and that doesn't mean that we have to stop fighting for our democracy, but there's a way to do that. Because ultimately, I think that's the other major thing that we have to say today. <laughs> Movements, whether they're, they're fascist or communist or what, that want to tear down a democracy win when violence begins, no matter who starts it and no matter who continues it. Fascist ideologies feed on violence. Violence by anyone against anyone. Yeah. The only way to save democracy is to practice democracy. <laughs> That's it. And I'll take responsibility for this too. You and I have talked a lot together and separately about the existential threats that we believe we face as a country. And I believe those threats are real. 
and the only answer to them is the practice of democracy peacefully and at the ballot box. That's it. That's the only solution. Yeah. How do we strike that balance? How do we strike the balance going forward on forums like this of telling the truth about the threats we face, yet reminding people, and I'm going to do it every time now, reminding people that that when we say we have to we have to push back, we have to stand up, we we mean nonviolently. That has to be the the foundation of any movement to counter the authoritarian threats we face. Even if nonviolent means fall short and we lose at the ballot box, that is the the social compact we've agreed to. We are not going to resort to violence. We are we're going to use our, our voices and our activism, um, but we're not going to fall for the fascist trap. That's absolutely right. I think you just did a perfect job of doing it. It's about reminding people what we're here working together for. Uh, most things worth struggling for, or we struggle for these things without violence. You leave your heart and soul on the field and do everything you can do without resorting to violence. Um, the language of struggle, even the language of fighting for what you believe in, doesn't need to be a literal call to pick up a weapon and kill. It's not what this is about. Um, and I think the ways in which we work together in this struggle and we, we, we organize and we, we show up together for our democracy, the way we do that and the goal are kind of the same thing. We are practicing the world we want to live in. And that's a world in which even the most important collective decisions we make, even at points of deep, deep disagreement within our society, are settled through democracy, through debate, through organizing, and through question about who among us believes what and how many of us believe it. And let's let's go figure that out the, the only way that works at the ballot box, through democracy, through organizing, through politics, right? That's what it is. Um, you can't cross the threshold into something else. And I think it does have to be said You and I are trying to have a conversation about how to be responsible in this. I think we ought to have the same expectation for everyone. <laughs> Even if a political leader you believe in is the victim of a violent attack, that's not an excuse to call for retributive violence. It's not an excuse to say, see, we really are in a civil war. It's not an excuse to say, see, here's proof the government can't protect anyone. We have to take the law into our own hands and arm ourselves, right? We can't lose the courage or the moral clarity to continue to call that out. Um, because again, a spiral of violence committed by anyone against anyone only serves those who want to take a peaceful political system and turn it into something else, something that's about rule by force. Um, you can't, get, can't let them get away with that. So we're going to have to be brave enough to be criticized. We have to be clear about what we believe in, but I don't think anything about what we believe has changed in the last 24 hours. Yeah, me neither. Um, there is a, a huge temptation and you're already, you're already seeing it. Both sides pointing at each other saying you started it. No, you started it. The, the violent, rhetoric on your side is, is the cause of this. No, no, it's the other side. And I mean, I think there is, is room for holding each other uh, accountable, but it is such a tightrope walk. Um, my own Senator J.D. Vance said that this attack is Joe Biden's fault. I think that turns up the temperature. I don't think that does anything to help. I mean, we even had, I think, a representative from, from Georgia, Mike Collins, say, um, let me look it up so I get it right, said that Biden sent the orders to, to execute the president. And part of me wants to just ignore that and hope that that escalatory rhetoric goes away. My... Um, pessimistic side says it's not going to go away. It's just going to get ramped up more and more and more because it's politically useful. And I, 
I don't know how to counter it without responding in kind and pointing out all the incitements from the other side over the past years. I think that's right. I, I think maybe one way to think about it is to step back and just say, why do these politicians reflexively believe and understand that this violence, any violence, helps their political cause, right? Yeah. It, if you are leading a political movement or aspiring, as J.D. Vance does, to lead a political movement in which violence serves your advantage tactically, you can this, this is good for you and you're going to, to ramp up the temperature when it happens, time to take a really, really good look in the mirror. No one who's fighting for, for democratic values, no one who's fighting for the kind of democracy that you and I believe in, no one who's fighting for truly free and fair elections, no one who's fighting for the best traditions of this republic, looks at a gunman on a roof opening fire on a presidential candidate and the crowd around him and sees political advantage to be gained. If you do, it's really time to stop and take a step back. And if your leaders that you respect see that gunman and think, wow, this helps me and respond in that way, maybe you shouldn't be following those leaders because they're sending you off a cliff and you and I have both seen what's on the other side. It might be an instructive moment here to think about the the aesthetic of violence on the right and the the propensity for politicians to use violence in their commercials. As we're talking, I'm just going to roll these clips. I don't want to dignify them with with the audio, but you'll see Marjorie Taylor Greene here shooting at at a target. You see the same representative from Georgia, Mike Collins, doing his obligatory AR-15 uh, ad as he was running last time. I mean, this comes up again and again and again. It's almost defining of the the MAGA political movement. And I'm thinking of it of, of it now because of your observation that if if you're committed to democracy and solving our differences peacefully, you don't resort to that kind of imagery. You you don't immediately adopt the the aesthetic of, of violence and guns if you really believe in the social compact that I take for granted that we solve our differences peacefully. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. I mean, what kind of leaders around the world pose with guns? Yeah. Make it a part of their aesthetic. You know, I mean, you, you almost never see insurgent and terrorist leaders posing without machine guns and rocket propelled grenades all over the place. You know, they become status symbols for them too. Um, it's, it's literally a way of saying, and I want to be clear, I'm not accusing these people of being terrorists. What I am saying is that when an instrument of violence becomes the symbol of your political movement, you might have a problem. Yeah. There are a few, sorry, go ahead and finish the thought. No, please. I don't want to use this as a reporting opportunity because people always get the story wrong in the first few hours, but there are a few, I think, unassailable facts. And one of them is that the shooter, 20 year old from Pennsylvania named Thomas Crooks used uh, a legally acquired AR-15. And I don't, I don't think that's accidental. No, of course not. I mean, it's, it's certainly not accidental. And we live in a society saturated with weapons that were designed to fire as many rounds of human targets as they possibly could in a short period of time as possible. And that's what, that's what they are. Um, I, I used to carry one of these things for a living. Um, certainly not something that I wanted to ever become part of my life after I hung up the uniform. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I know what, I know what it can do. I've fired one at other people, um, and had similar weapons fired at me and seen the results. I don't think it's an accident uh, that that's the weapon of choice, um, not just because it's good at putting a lot of bullets down range really fast, but also because it's become a, a cultural object for us in a way that I think, again, ought to really give us pause. You know, I think about the significance that the AK-47 acquired in certain countries, you know, 
and a lot more than a weapon. It was a cultural symbol. It, you know, it's on national flags for a reason. Um, it's it's not not what you want to see in your neighborhood at any level. At some level, I I do wonder you know, what we'll learn in the coming days about what lay behind this this violence. Um, but on another level, I almost think it doesn't matter. I mean, the fact that this was a 20 year old kid with an assault rifle, the fact that this was a 20 year old kid, barely out of high school kid who thought the answer to whatever was going on in his head was to fire a weapon into a crowd and at a presidential candidate, the fact that he was able to do it. And we live in a society where we've created enough access to those kinds of weapons that it's trivial to imagine, you know, I would assume a completely untrained 20 year old kid with no real clue what he's doing to do something like this. These are the real issues. And I think it's inevitable that when you have a society where politics is steeped in violence or violent rhetoric and, and actual violence, we've had a lot of politicians shot. Many of them on the right, um, you know, Congressman Steve Scalise, you know, a guy I've interacted with in congressional hearings and disagree with vociferously on certain issues, you know, shot playing softball with a similar weapon. Um, we're going to see more of this until we recognize that, again, for, for both parties, appeals to violence, the fetishization of violence, the encouraging of violence, the encouraging of supporters to believe they're existentially threatened, and the deliberate creation of a sense of existential threat for the other side. You know, Project 2025 existentially scares the hell of a lot of, out of a lot of people for good reason. Um, saying you're going to be a dictator on day one of your presidency if reelected scares the hell of a lot of people, out, out of a lot of people for good reason. So in an atmosphere where politics is allowed to become existential for people at a personal level, you're going to see this. And stepping back from the brink is going to require leadership on both sides of this thing. Yeah. And I'm not being both sides ist about it. Um, the real burden on this falls on those who look at a shooting, look at a gunman on a roof with a high powered rifle and see political advantage immediately and act to seize it by raising the temperature. We've either got to stop following people like that, or we've got to beat them at the ballot boxes, which really ultimately is the same thing. Yeah. Well, Mike, I, I wanted to talk to you of all people today because we've both seen where countries go when they don't figure it out. I've been in the middle of uh, civil war zones and... Um, and imagining that in my neighborhood just makes me want to redouble my efforts to assert every time that the only answer is nonviolent. The only answer between now and November is organizing and speaking out and winning at the ballot box. Because as you said in the film Against All Enemies, if we do it the other way, the shooter's way, that is the road to hell. Yeah. And I, I look at the way you're reacting to this. On your, I look at your face and I listen to your voice and you know, not just the words that you're saying, all of which I agree with, but clearly like the sadness and concern that you have in this moment. And I think, okay, that's the only appropriate response from any leader I want to follow. You know, anything else, anything else really ought to make us again, really, really question. But um, I thank you for the kind of leadership that you're showing. And, you know, it's always good to talk to you. It's a hard day to do it. Same, Mike. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ken.